Thank you so much, Hao. That was an incredibly, uh, incredibly insightful, albeit tough. But um, as as uh, the purpose of this next panel is really about finding opportunities, especially when we're in the deep of the FUD, the fear, uncertainty and doubt. Um, so I couldn't be more excited uh, about today's panel. For those of us who are already based here in Hong Kong, Shanghai, we are privy to a dialogue uh, with both onshore managers, regulators, and offshore investors, interpreting the appetite from both sides. While there are clearly ge geopolitical risks, as allocators, we still have a responsibility to deploy capital, and even more so as advisors to global investors who are focused on alpha generation. So it's during these periods, we actually get a little bit, we get the most excited in a way. Um, joining us tonight is uh, SDIC Essence Shanghai's general manager, Ms. Fei Liu, director of RCM Alternatives and head of China, Mr. Matt Bradford. And finally, of course, the CIO and founder of Bro Investment Group, Mr. William Ma. Welcome everyone. Okay, so, um, we only have about 40 minutes uh, on the clock, so let's begin. Um, you have there the poll uh, in terms of the appetite, uh, William, you probably can sort of have a check there. Help us read the tea leaves a bit here, and, and not just from the speech, but also from the overall communication coming from the regulators over the last quarter and, and recently. Markets looking bad, but they're not sitting, uh, they're not exactly sitting on their, their hands. Uh, looking past at the deleveraging policies from regulators over the last quarter, um, which sectors and industries should we start to look at um, in this phase of the, uh, of the cycle? Thanks, Elton. I think the interesting part about the poll, if you like, is half people are positive, half people are negative. So it's kind of like a half cup full, half cup, you know, empty situation, which means, you know, opportunity for active and hedge fund manager. To put some number into perspective, I think, you know, China, as Hao mentioned earlier, uh, in particular, the Hong Kong market is trading at very, you know, um, undemanding valuation. And uh, for example, the China Asia market now we are trading at nine times price to earnings versus Asia Pacific 11 times. But in terms of EPS growth, you know, in China, we are looking at 9.5%, you know, EPS growth versus west, west of the Asia, about 6%. So I think fundamental and valuation is attractive, but what we need is catalyst. And back to your question, you know, Elvin, I think the key two words, what we get from the party congress is one, development. I think we are ensuring that, you know, China continue to develop, you know, on different areas. And second is about, you know, unemployment. So I think there will be more policy supporting, you know, this two uh, um, kind of like initiative. So in that regard, I think there are three sectors that we are seeing more positive kind of like themes. Uh, in particular, we are seeing some hedge fund manager in, in increasing the exposure as well. The first one is domestic consumption. I believe, you know, the inflation in China is not very high, which, you know, kind of like create a good background or backdrop for the Chinese government to continue to push consumption by, you know, tax cut subsidy, subsidies and also to create employment in the service, you know, sector, if you like. So we are relatively positive on the domestic consumption on the consumer staple side. If you look at some of the beverage company, actually their stock price and earnings is quite stable. And some of the subsector for consumer staple is kind of like white goods manufacturer. We are seeing, you know, price increase uh, 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 despite the volume is down and earnings is going up as well. So those are some of the niche sector that we should look for. The second one is um, policy support. For example, the electric vehicle type, new energy type, we believe there will be more policy support you know, in this sector as well. Um, the last one is about development, which is the high-end manufacturing. So we believe there will be more kind of like support subsidy or policy you know, on the make in China or high-end manufacturing sector in the medium to long term. So those three sectors, we are seeing you know, positive you know, uh, catalysts you know, from the party congress, Elvin. Mm, thanks for that. Um, I mean, I actually, I want to pivot here over to Matt, who's coming from the U.S. Uh, we all know there's there's issues here, uh, and maybe William can pipe in as well. When we speak to investors and allocators who come from the U.S., it's obviously there's a lot going on. It's quite bearish. But how do we how do we give them insight on what is very what is clearly a very negative? Um, uh, negative sentiments, particularly around the property market, high youth unemployment, and, and their severity. You kind of quoted a few points there, but 
how do you position it for investors who are still a bit skittish, but still curious as well? As you pointed out, we're very oversold. Right. I, I think you need to ignore the noise. I mean, there's a saying you look at, you know, the the best house in the worst neighborhood. So although it may be dismal in China is, you know, is it worse elsewhere? You know, uh, William pointed out inflation being low in China. You know, there's a different story in the United States. Uh, and for the traders that I deal with and hedge fund managers, volatility is not a bad thing. So really just looking at volatility, directional volatility, the markets moving in, in, in both directions um, is, is what, you know, the, the strategies that I deal with strive for. And, you know, I can only speak to um, hedge fund managers and, and CTAs that are trading commodities and indices uh, you know, I'll defer to William being the expert in terms of looking exactly through the tea leaves in terms of what the, the trends are and how you can capitalize it in mainland China. Yeah, William, what, what do you think about that? I mean, uh, Matt raised a really good point. Things aren't so great elsewhere either. Um, there was just a $1.5 uh, trillion dollar mar uh, margin call on the energy sector. Uh, Winter is coming in Europe as well. Uh, it seems U.S. is is still on the precipice of a of a recession, but you know what? This is the type of environment where traders and alpha generators really start to shine. So, um, yeah, what are your thoughts on on where we need to see regulation go? Yeah, I think you know, no news is good news, or you know, no <laughs> catalyst is good catalyst. We are actually seeing a peak of you know short interest in the Hong Kong market, if you like. So, I think a lot of people are kind of like putting negative bet, but if there are certain kind of like positive catalysts or, you know, kind of like recovery of the economic figure in October and November, I think that will squeeze out the short squeeze part. So I think as active manager and hedge fund, those are things to watch out or they would be positioned. Again, I think we, we need earnings. We need fundamental to be improving. From my perspective, I think we've passed the worst time, if you like, and, you know, relaxation of the property market. We just need a quarter or two to, think, to see things, you know, kind of like turning better. But again, you want to position yourself, you know, ahead of, you know, those, you know, no news is good news situation. Yeah, yeah, I, could, I, could, I couldn't agree more. Um, having said this, though, uh, China, actually, the regulators started opening up the markets uh, just, uh, just about a month ago, in fact. Uh, back in the day, uh, we've been waiting, what, three years now for the QV regime to open up. Um, I'm going to pivot over to, to Faye. Uh, some of the most exciting news this quarter was, in fact, that QV, uh, the expansion of the QV rules, 45 instruments out of the 101 available uh, on the market are now open to foreign investors. It's actually very exciting. A lot of the CT man CTA managers that we speak to um, offshore are, are very excited to get access. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the opportunity set here for foreign investors and, and share with us maybe some statistics about the market depth. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you, Alvin. So as most of you already know, uh, Chinese regulators and exchanges have jointly announced that starting September 2nd, QP participants are officially approved to trade onshore commodity futures and options. And so it's, it is a very exciting news, which we all have been waiting for for years. And the message is clear. The opening up of China's futures market is accelerating. Um, I do have some stats for commodity futures. So according to China Futures Association in 2021, China is the largest commodity market in the world. And foreign participation in commodity futures is about 10% of total market. In our own analysis, in terms of trading volume, China's derivative market is about 45 to 50% of the Asia's market, and it's about 15, 15 to 20% of global market. And in, in the latest stats published by FIA, in terms of global exchange volume ranking, Dalian Commodity Exchange ranked the eighth, Zhengzhou Commodity Exchange ranked the tenth, and Shanghai Futures Exchange ranked the twelfth. Um, so let's take SD Crude Oil as example. Um, this contract listed on SHFE and it was the first contract open to overseas investors in 2021. The market size of SC crude oil contract is second only to Brent and WTI. As for foreign participation on this contract, it accounts for 25% of total market. And this market, this contract is only about four years old. 
I mean, on one hand, it demonstrates a very high correlation with Brent and WTI. On the other hand, it has also shown some independence in price fluctuation. So um, in short, I would say the opening up of China market is, is an ongoing case and there's still so much potential to grow. That's awesome. Um, th- th- um, I think that last, with that one stat in there about 10% foreign participation in the onshore market, which uh, as you mentioned, is one of the largest, if not the largest commodities market, is, is very appetizing for uh, offshore uh, portfolio managers looking to diversify or looking for some exposure that's, uh, I think is, is clearly in many ways uncorrelated to the other strategies. Uh, when you look at the 45 new instruments, um, do you see any particular interest for foreign investors? Now we know that there's a, a quite a bit of active participation in the internationalized uh, contracts. When we look at the new ones, uh, which one stands out for you for your clients? Um, well, apart from crude oil country, which we just mentioned, um, this copper, this rubber, iron ore, and soybean sur- oil, I mean, some of these commodity prices are increasingly driven by the price action in China. And soon enough, you will find this carbon emission futures and freight futures. I mean, those haven't, haven't been launched yet, but still have gained lots of tractions. Um, let's take copper as an example. So copper is another product of common interest among overseas investors. And there are three major copper futures m- market globally, LME, CME, and SHFE. So according to FIA in 2021, CU copper futures on SHFE ranked the first in the world by trading volume. At the same time, SHFE copper also serves as a proxy for China's macroeconomy. So before September this year, overseas investors can only access BU copper futures on INE, which is another copper future contract with lower trading volume and different contract dynamics. But now in the new era of QV, overseas investor can also engage in both CU copper futures and options on SHFE, which is the largest market. Um, and meanwhile, foreign participation in domestic iron ore futures also continue to rise. China has the largest iron ore consumption and is the largest importer in the world. So with China's continuous effort in, bring, in being a price maker instead of a price taker on iron ore, we have seen many global miners and international trading houses have been more and more involved in domestic iron ore futures to, to carry out hedging as a new channel to protect the mining and sales profits. That, that's fascinating. Um, Matt, I'm going to bounce over to you because this is very interesting. We have some amazing stats here with the onshore market um, as it opens up. Uh, RCM works really uh, closely currently in China onshore and with offshore allocators in the international markets and in the CTA space. Um, Matt, you're no tourist to China at all, of course. So uh, your team is a bit more familiar uh, than most, uh, most allocators that we know. From a trading perspective, what are the differences that you see between onshore and offshore markets that, that we need to pay attention to as, as the open up? Yeah, great question. There's so many nuances that make China just an entirely different animal. Um, You know, let me just spit off a few. And it's certainly been a learning curve, but, you know, we've had boots on the ground in trading China for the last five years. So, um, you know, you have to tag orders. uh, And and again, I'm speaking specifically to futures, which is relevant with this new QFI regime. You have to tag orders if you're opening or closing Uh, You can be on both sides of the market. So in other words, you're not even flat. You may not have exposure, but you could be long corn, short corn, same contract. Uh, There's not span margin like there is uh, in European and U.S. exchanges where if you're long and short, uh, you're effectively double margined. Uh, There's two one week holidays in China where the market closes for a week. So you need to pay close attention to that. The exchanges um, increased margins leading up to that. So you need to be cognizant. Generally, a lot happens during a holiday. So you can expect gap opens, you know, against you or in your favor. Um, you know, there's an overnight session in China that some of the commodities are more liquid than the day session, which, uh, you know, is, you know, not unexpected, you know, without, trading. Um, there's tea breaks. So, you know, there's breaks during the day, uh, two of those, um, you're not able to execute spreads, so you're legging spreads. So you have uh, 
You know, you potentially give up edge on both sides. Um, you know, there's a massive retail component versus, uh, you know, institutional players, which I think will change. You know, it was interesting that Faye pointed out that foreign participation is only 10%. Which uh, leads me to believe we're in early days, and these markets will become much more efficient, you know, in in the the quarters uh, and, and years to come. What is um, not expected, or wasn't expected for some of the traders that we work, is while there are crude oil contracts and copper contracts and gold and silver contracts that trade on other exchanges, they're not perfectly correlated. So there's definitely an arbitrage opportunity where. Um, you know, I wouldn't say there's inverse relationships, but they're not always moving lockstep uh, with other exchanges on, um, you know, globally, which is very, very interesting, you know, from a trading perspective. High level, I think those are the, the, the biggest trading nuances from a, you know, futures perspective. Um, from a regulatory perspective, there's, there's always, and, and, and you and I both appreciate this, there's there's a stigma that onshore regulators are frequently intervening in the market. Is in your experience, is is this true? Do foreign investors need to adjust their strategy materially for onshore regulation? I don't know that they need to adjust it, but they need to know what the rules are and they need to play by the rules. The regulate the regulation to me is a good thing, and they're really leveling the playing field. Uh, we're all playing by the same rules. So if you have, you know, let's say you're a small emerging manager and you have five or 10 million USD equivalent, or you're, you know, a, a large player um, kind of levels a playing field. You know, you just need to know what the rules are. And the, the approach we've taken is um, we're collaborating with local talent, uh, mainland talent. We're finding firms that, you know, have a global vision and we're, we're trying to find trusted partners. There is uh, there's no instant gratification in China. Um, you know, us building our business, it's taken way longer than one would anticipate. It's cost way more money than one would anticipate. Um, but, um, you know, we're starting to, starting to, to, our hard work starting to pay off. So really the regulation, some view as a negative, I view it as a positive. Yeah. And just for those uh, who are first to uh, to meet RCM, uh, some of their onshore strategies working with the local partners have had outsized returns um, in the CTA market. So congratulations on that, Matt. Um, I want to switch over just a little bit uh, back to uh, Faye. I mean, we, we talked a little bit about foreign investors and PRC. Just before I dive into alpha discussions, could you maybe just brief us on what the breakdown is between um, you know the types of foreign investors are coming coming in? Are these like the Glencores, or are there other types of institutionals and FIs uh, playing in the space now? Uh, this is this is this is kind of an interesting question because, as we mentioned earlier, it's, it's very retail in terms of its behavioral pattern, and a lot of investors are wondering how much time will it take before we not crowd out the trade, but um, you know, increase the efficiency in the market there uh, with respect to offshore. Yeah, actually, foreign investors have been engaged in China futures market for almost two decades. And commercial companies such as, you know, the ones you just mentioned, Glencore, this Cargill, Tropicra, and et cetera, they came in and they set up UFI and joint venture and they built onshore factories. And these commercial giants have been trading onshore futures for ages to hedge their physical exposure. With China's getting more and more involved in the global economy. The exchanges have introduced several internationalized futures contracts for those who doesn't have Wufi or joint venture or even QV qualifications. So we can see mostly both these commercial companies engage in onshore futures trading through internationalized futures contract as these contracts support physical delivery. On the other hand, QV is most popular among financial institutions. Um, QV investor can either trade directly via QV or they can use QV to invest in onshore funds. So till today, there are 723 QVs of which more than 60% were from Hong Kong, US and Singapore. And most of them are financial institutions, including banks, hedge funds, there's public funds, trusts, um, asset management firms and security companies. In the past, QV was only allowed to participate in stock index futures and was limited to hedging only. Now, 
the new QFI regulations have reduced the application threshold and expanded the scope of trading to commodities. We should expect more foreign QFI participants coming from non-financial institutions background, such as commercial and industrial companies, and also more foreign CTA traders coming in with their advanced strategies. Mm. Um, I'm going to come back to uh, CTA and advanced strategies in a second, Faye. Um, William, Matt, I want to talk a bit about alpha. Um, our investors are uh, neither excited about the large caps, even though they're oversold. There's about 20,000 registered hedge fund and private equity managers onshore. There's a, f- a split of roughly 50-50 on, on private and public equity. Uh, so my question is to you, maybe William, you can take this first, is what strategies, what strategies are you seeing perform well in 2022? And more importantly, let's look forward into 2023, uh, how you'd be advising your, your offshore investors uh, for the next six to 12 months. Yeah, sure, Elvin. I've been, you know, investing in Asia and China hedge fund for almost 20 years, you know, starting when I was like three years old. So, <laughs> so actually there are um, a lot of, you know, alpha opportunity. I think besides the beta opportunity we talk about in terms of alpha, I'll share two real case with you. The first one is about four years ago, one of the largest U.S. pension fund asked me to bring them to see six domestic China uh, macro and CTA manager. And they were interested in two. They told me that they did a correlation analysis out of their existing 10 billion you know, CTA portfolio. And then they find out the negative correlation of those two managers and then they want to put in a ticket. So the alpha opportunity has been very obvious, you know, starting four years ago, but we are seeing it coming back again. We are seeing an RFP from some of them. And then the second real case is about six months ago, one of the largest Singapore pension fund asked us to do an analysis of the domestic China CTA and CP, you know, fund a convertible bond fund with them. And the correlation over the last seven years for the China CTA with the global hedge fund index is negative, you know, 0.04. For the CB, you know, index is 0.07. And both of the strategies yielding uh, mid-teens type of return. And the third real case is, you know, Q3 this year. The China Asia market was down 15%, you know, in Q3. But, you know, CTA and CB, for example, some of the strategy that we're investing is actually uh, ranged from down 2 to up 2%. So I think that is a hard figure supporting the alpha or the negative correlation with global and local manager. So um, the second point is, you know, what we're excited, you know, for next year, we believe CTA and convertible bond will continue to be doing well. And with some uh, extent, uh, China macro and some active trading manager, because our, our view and position is, you know, next year is going to be a, an exciting year for the China Asia market. And besides CTA and uh, convertible bond, we believe, you know, some of the active manager can can do well. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of us here and uh, forgive us for being uh, to the audience members, forgive, forgive us for being biased, but actively managed strategies is what we're all about. We've consistently seen uh, actively managed managed strategies do well in this type of environment. The passive strategies over the last uh, last eighteen months have, have gotten pretty uh, decimated, um, and so uh, we're we're definitely excited, and especially for those managers that we've met who are savvy enough to uh, keep some dry powder on the side. This is a very very interesting market to move into. Uh, Matt, what are you seeing from your end in terms of uh, the managers that you've been working with from a performance level? Um, I dare say some of them are, are some of them are even in double digit, but I'll let you uh, uh, brief us there. Yeah, no, I'm excited to hear that. You know, William thinks CTA is going to be positive in 23. That's music to my ears. I think a lot <laughs> of it from an investor perspective. Uh, and a manager perspective, what makes CTAs attractive in China is one, there's a lot of markets that don't trade anywhere else on the globe. So, you you know, it makes sense for that negative correlation because you're getting alpha that you can't get elsewhere. And, um, you know, these institutions and even these big managers globally can access China and expand their capacity because again, they're the non-correlation in the market. So it's really beneficial to both the investor and the manager. So speaking, you know, from my lens, I'm drilling down on CTAs and, um, you know, you're right. A lot of these strategies have performed. Uh, The fundamental strategies, believe it or not, are performing. Um, You know, looking at some of the strategies that I track, uh, you know, best performer fundamental strategies up, you know, 30%. 
um, max drawdown, you know, 10%. A lot of these strategies that I track have an annualized volatility around 10%. Wow. Um, the most strategies in terms of subsector I see are market neutral strategies. Mm -hmm. They're performing. The fundamental stock strategies in 22 uh, have not. I mean, the 20 strategies that I looked at here yesterday when I was just perusing uh, database, only one out of 20 strategies was positive for the year. Um, you know, my experience, um, you know, I have a fundamental strategy that's been live uh, for a couple of years, 100% systematic that's, you know, performing. We're launching an ARB strategy that we've been setting up the infrastructure for, it seems like, forever. That's going to go live here in the next couple uh, months. Uh, intraday high frequency strategies that we track, um, you know, we're going to launch one of those uh, Monday next week. Um, and then we have two strategies that we consult with that are mid to short term strategies are relatively flat this year. I mean, up a couple uh, percentage points, down a couple percentage points. Um, multi strat index have performed. I mean, unless you're long equity in China, I mean, there's mixed results, but you know most of these alpha strategies are performing. To me, um, as an allocator, the most you know, critical thing for me is not only do you perform, but do you manage risk? So I'm really keen on what the risk adjusted returns look like. Yeah, I think the culture of risk is something that you definitely bring, need to bring to the table. Um, the days of relying on the long view that fundamentals will eventually express themselves in the market is is, is not really working out this year. And uh, yeah, I would agree. A lot of the, the ARB and the market neutral strategies are really uh, really shining in, in, especially in the CTA space. So um, on that note, on that note, when it comes to um, the QFI uh, regime, which I think, you know, you and I were actually working on helping offshore investors bridge that gap. Uh, wh what, what are we doing different here than I guess what some of the uh, traditional uh, avenues are? It's a great question. Um, I mean, again, I think it boils down to, and I know I, at the risk of sounding redundant, is just finding local partners and dig, dig, dig and get multiple opinions. Because it seems like the more people you talk to, you get different perspectives. And, you know, the appetite is so great from a Western in investor perspective and a Western manager perspective to access China. But it, it, it's just so different. So I, I don't know that we're doing anything differently. You just need to be patient and, you know, just keep asking questions, ask questions for, from local council, ask questions from several different prime brokers, you know, legal, yeah. uh, talk to I the exchanges, talk to local domestic traders, just get as many opinions as you can. Yeah, man, I, I, I think you really point in, in summary, uh, we can't be a tourist about it. Uh, if we're going to do this, we have to take it seriously. But the alpha is there for the taking. Uh, we just have to put in the time. Uh, on that note, uh, Faye, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, algorithmic, more importantly, systematic strategies. Uh, there's actually a lot of pop, uh, it's hugely popular. Um, we ourselves, we helped a few teams from Shanghai build their offshore business, which are systematic, uh, algorithmic, quant in nature. Um, with so many algo managers onshore, what's the role for offshore investors to compete in this space, you think? Um, the fact is, you know, overseas algo trading firm, they have come into China market for more than a decade. They mm. came in, they have Wufi and joint venture. Most of, most of them were already highly successful in their home country. And they brought in their super weapon, which are their advanced strategies, hardware and technology over these years. They have created a huge impact on, on, on local algo trading firms, and they are definitely playing a leading role in the domestic markets. Um, actually, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you brought this up because um, um, I do get this question pretty often. And my friends from overseas, my, my, my overseas clients, they always ask me, you know, um, can we trade algo? You know, uh, is there any rule against HFT? I think. You know, 
sorry, Alvin, I'm just going to take two more minutes to address this concern. Um, I think there's a genuine misconception of Chinese regulators over algo trading. I mean, if you just look at what the law what the law says, I mean, the futures and derivative law, which came into practice in August this year, it stipulates that no entity or individual shall manipulate the futures and derivative market. And uh, manipulation, in this case, refers to price manipulation, uh, volume manipulation, self trading, spoofing, and so on. And the law also stipulates that those who place orders through program trading shall comply with the regu regulations and report to the exchange. So we have two requirements here manipulation and reporting. So coming back to most of the question coming from overseas, can clients trade algo and should they be concerned? I mean, as long as you comply with these two requirements, you're fine. Your, your strategy is legit. And I actually have discussed this matter with one of my friends who works for an exchange on shore. And he told me there are basically two dimensions to get whether your strategy is legit strategy. Number one, does the liquidity does the level of liquidity fit rightfully for the current status of China futures markets? Number two, um, does the liquidity come with high degree of concentration? I mean, after all, no one would ever reject liquidity as long as it's legit. So, yep. so yeah, and there's definitely a huge space for overseas um, algo trading firms. Yeah, yeah, and, and one one thing I I do uh, recognize is that these trading these rules. Are consistent whether you're onshore or offshore participants in the market. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it is a level playing field. Um, I want to jump over to uh, investor appetite, guys. Um, Matt, William, this one's for you. When we look at the appetite uh, for onshore managers versus offshore, uh, I guess, global managers looking to access China internally, um, where where do you see that where do you see that happening? Because there, we know a lot of onshore alpha drivers who are raising capital quite easily onshore, but uh, there's 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 a lot of potential uh, allocators who who could they could tap into offshore as well. But at the same time, offshore investors might be more comfortable with offshore managers who are accessing the market onshore. Uh, William, this is a nuanced one. You want to you want to try this one first? Yeah, actually, I think more global investors uh, are seeing the benefit of investing in domestic onshore China manager directly, either with their own Q3 or, you know, talk to people like you, me and Matt about it. At least, you know, reference check and checking the local guys. Because I think, you know, numbers speak for itself. If you look at the performance, as I mentioned earlier, the domestic manager every year outperform the global people trading China, you know, by five to six percent. And in particular, there are a certain batch of mid-sized manager that is unheard of, you know, globally, but they are trading at very nimble, you know, niche space, no matter CTA or convertible bond, capturing the local opportunity. And there are some structure alpha. Uh, uh, Elvin, if I mentioned on the convertible bond, because yeah. the CB actually they got you know price refix mechanism in which some of the global players did not realize you know is happening that way. So I think there are some structural alpha in terms of certain sub strategy. We are seeing potential new opportunities like volatility trading, you know, going to be happening in China as well. So those mm -hmm. are really niche strategy that only onshore manager currently looking at. And that's why, you know, the short answer on the global demand is since the Q3 is opening up, since those numbers are being reported, since there are more global uh, service providers, like some of the global custodian and PP are setting up shops locally, I believe mm. more global manager and taking into the onshore China manager space. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, Matt, you want to pipe in here? Yeah, I mean, I echo uh, William's sentiment. Um, I think the biggest challenge for, for me has been due diligence. You know, uh, in 2018, 19, pre-COVID, I was over there several times a year. I could meet these managers, tour around with them, do on-sites. You know, um, fortunately, I'm not saying COVID was a good thing, but, you know, what it allowed me to do not getting there was hire consultants. So have boots on the ground that can do the due diligence. But I think it's very important um, to meet people in person. Um, you know, the deal terms are a lot different in China. So you have to get accustomed to that. Um, not necessarily say the structure is different, but what you're accustomed to in fees and transparency and, you know, management fees may be different. Um, incentive fees may be different. The, um, 
you know, commercials, not only maybe different, but the payouts. And um, one thing that I really, really like doing business in China is most of the strategies that I've dealt with um, domestic that we've explored is, you know, the manager eats their own cooking. So, you know, that's very important for us that interests are aligned with the investors when the manager has, um, you know, his or her own money and capital at risk right alongside the investors. You know, you know typically how much does that look like? I mean, uh, do, is there a number in terms of alignment of interest? Do you, at least 5%, 15% capital? Um, yeah, is well, there a... Yeah, I mean, I think it varies strategy to strategy because some of these strategies, like the ARB strategy, we're looking at, you know, um, it's capacity constraints. So, you know, uh, I, I don't necessarily want the trader to be their own biggest client because then, you know, it could be problematic. But the fact that they do have, you know, some of their own skin in the game, it, it, it checks the box and makes us feel a little bit more comfortable. But it varies, you know, strategy to strategy. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, guys. We are down to the last minute. So um, I wanted to thank uh, William, Faye, Matt. You guys have been amazing. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this has been a, a thrilling session, even though it does look bearish. As you can see, those of us who are advising investors are very, very excited about the next six months to come. Long term, still very bullish. And uh, so long as we can cut through the noise, and find the opportunities while everyone is uh, is fearful. Um, on that note, there will be a replay of this uh, of this event. Thank you for those of us who are joining from Tencent meeting, um, and for those of us who are joining from overseas. Thank you, everyone, and we'll talk to you soon.